Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Webpage, and I improve experiences for people through design. Today, I'm going to talk about how to create a future for all through design. We'll start with a quick story on why I care about this topic. Then we'll move into the what, the how, and the why of ethics for design. Then we'll sum it up. Uh, so let's start with a short story about why I care. A couple of years ago, I was walking through Florence, Italy. And I'm not sure if you've been there, but the side streets twist and turn. And on the horizon, I saw this dome. When I made it closer to the dome, I was struck by the beauty of this building, this historic, intricate, special building. And a word popped in my head when I was looking at it, and it was design. As I stood looking at this cathedral, I realized a group of people were tasked to design this wonder. Uh, the design stood for centuries. The design had an impact. As a designer, I've seen how much influence I can have on experiences. I remember the first time I was uh, in a whiteboarding session at work, and we had this table. Pretty much we were doing a, a workflow for an employee. And there was one column that had human. And it was up to me, the designer, to decide whether or not to eliminate this human in this flow. Design can have negative and sometimes harmful impact, and sometimes we don't consider the social consequences of our design decisions. Usually when I hear people talk about design, especially here in San Francisco, they think of something like this, you know, something that's visual, simple, and not too complicated. And it's easy to find poor user experiences. Uh, this is a screenshot of me trying to read the news, blocked by ads. I, I love eco-friendly straws, but they fall apart. They stain the water. And these are silly, low pain moments, you know. Uh, but designs, design can have more impact than that. Design can influence movements, start wars. Design can inspire the future. Here's the design of a, a you know, an early prototype of a cell phone from the Star Trek series. It can design, you know, we can predict robots. And all this stuff seems like sci-fi and in the future, but guess what? We live in San Francisco where the stuff is happening. <laughs> design can give access to people. The design of the teletype printer made the device more affordable and smaller so people can have access to this, including the co-founders of Microsoft. Design can slow down access for people. When I lived in Nashville, it took hours to get around the city through the bus system because each bus had to go downtown instead of cutting across neighborhoods to save time. Design can block access. When I was in Seattle trying to buy groceries, I couldn't you know, enter the Amazon Go store. To buy groceries, I needed the Amazon Go app on a smartphone with some digital form of payment. Design can remove people. Here's a robot designer taking my job. I'm only kidding, but uh, I went to the movie theater over here recently. I was standing in line where I usually see a cashier behind the desk. And so the cashier's monitors were facing me, the customer. Design has influenced inventions like this computation machine from the 1600s, also this computation machine from the 1980s, and each invention inspires the next one. And behind each invention is an inventor, is a creator. It's people like you. So for today's inventions, how will you use your skills to create a future for all? So why do I care about ethics? It's, it's because design can have a negative and sometimes harmful impact. In the words of Victor Popanek, he said, there are professions more harmful than industrial design but only a very few of them. And now being 2019, I think we can expand that to all design. Now let's look at what are ethics. I'm going to share an oversimplification of ethics. Ethics refers to a set of moral values with a focus on the right and wrong in behavior. Ethics has been around for a long time. We have three ethics to cover in today's talk duty, utility, and virtues. 
In the 1700s, a German philosopher named Immanuel Kant shared his views on deontological ethics. Now that's a big word, so I'll just refer to it as duty. This ethic promotes that the action itself is right or wrong and not the consequences of that action. It's the duty to respect others' rights. Another ethic we'll talk about was shared in 1780 by Jeremy Bentham. He pointed out that humans are driven by two drivers, pain and pleasure. We should aim to help the largest number of people be well and not feel pain. This approach is known as ut utilitarianism or utility. The belief promotes that we should maximize the well-being for the majority of a population. Finally, the third ethic, the ethical approach is virtues ethics, started with Socrates in Greece. Virtues ethics states that people are motivated by moral character. The choices you make represent you and your values. To recap, we have these three ethics here, duty, utility, and virtues. Uh, to apply this to a simple story, let's say you see a business owner um, cheating or, or stealing from someone. If you believe in the ethics of duty, you would help because it matches your moral rule to help. For utility, you would help because it maximizes the well-being. And for virtues, you would help because it aligns with your character traits you want to exhibit. I have to point out, uh, ethics does not mean something is lawful or is not lawful. For example, businesses were involved with slavery in the United States, but that's not ethical. Now let's see how ethics might help a business. As a person inside a company, you have your individual moral code. Your behavior can be influenced by everything from your coworkers to your country laws and society. Although ethics can be complex, the idea is for us to do little to no harm. When I told a designer this, he said, well, there's obvious harm, you know, think guns, and there's non-obvious harm. Most of my work as a tech designer is in the non-obvious. Great, we know there's a gray area. What can we do? There's a need to make the gray area more clear, and universities are teaching the next generation of tech workers ethics. Uh, one professor said, the choices that get made in building technology then have social ramifications. In my talk today, I won't be able to cover everything, so I recommend this resource, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and this other resource, the Mark Kula Center for Applied Ethics, has a really cool interactive tool with these lessons. Now that we understand what ethics are, we can move into the next section. So now that we understand what ethics are, we can move into the next section, how to apply ethics to design. We seem more concerned about work ethic than the ethics of our work. Like I said, there's this gray area. So we need to evaluate, evaluate our work for harm, especially in the non-obvious side. We can do that using these three ethics I pointed out earlier, duty, utility, and virtues. First, let's look at duty. As a designer, when you're doing your work, a question you can ask yourself is, what if everyone did what I'm about to do? The idea is that you're not allowed to do something yourself that you would not be willing to allow others do. Uh, all right, so let's come up with an example. As a designer, you are working on a way to increase engagement for a video platform. There are many ways to do this, but you propose when a video completes, the platform starts playing the next video automatically. The team loves this idea, and they ship it. Now you have auto-playing videos on your platform, but other companies take notice and want to increase engagement as well. Before you know it, other websites add auto-play videos. Some begin playing the video without the user pressing play. You wish you could go back to the design process and ask yourself, what if everyone did what I'm about to do? You may have chosen a different path. And luckily, you still can. Uh, you, you won't have regret, like one of the co-makers of the iPhone has mixed feelings of regret and pride. He said in an interview, I wake up in cold sweats every so often thinking, what did we bring to the world? He's not the only one. From Reddit to pop-up ads, creators are sharing their confessions and regrets with the press. As It's, 
A second question to ask yourself under duty is, am I treating people as a means or as an end? Each human being has an inherent value and we must respect it. So going back to the autoplay video example, what problem was the designer solving for? Was it to help the website visitor find more relevant videos or was it to increase watch times for ad revenue? In the New York Times article, let's take a drink. The CEO of a company for audience targeting said, video has been pushed into every user experience whether or not it fits because it's the way to make more money. In the same article, he goes on to explain that it's, you can generate 20 to 50 times more revenue with, uh, with these videos, especially autoplay videos. One problem with the autoplay videos is that someone has to decide what to play next. And we've given that decision to be made by a computer, by algorithms. And it's not clear what video will be surfaced from that stream of autoplay videos. James Bridle shared what he found when he started with simple children content on YouTube and made his way through autoplay videos to then disturbing violent content. Recently on June 25th, 2019, a Senate subcommittee questioned how major social media companies like Facebook use algorithms. The senator here was saying, uh, algorithm, algorithms that feed us a constant stream of increasingly more ex, uh, inflammatory content. Senator Markey is introducing a bill to tackle design features like autoplay that can harm children. In the hearing, he asked, can you confirm that YouTube is getting rid of that feature, autoplay videos? And the rep from Google said, I can't confirm that. It's clear that people want to turn off the autoplay experience. Besides disturbing and unrelated content, people find that autoplay videos are a waste of time and use too much data. Companies know the autoplay videos are time consuming. The CEO of Netflix said, we're competing with sleep. Remember I said most of these ethical frameworks are coming from universities. Well, at the University of Michigan, they evaluated Netflix's been watching design and the students proposed a way for people to set their own watch times. For autoplay videos, the designer could have asked, am I treating people as a means or as an end? And more than likely, this autoplay video solution started off as an experiment in the company. And it's easy to move people from being a person to a customer to a user, and eventually an experimental subject we start A-B testing ways to move the person to accomplish our goals instead of their own. And as a designer, we have to help the company keep the human's goals at the center. An example of this would be Apple's screen time feature, where they allow users to see how much time they spent on their device. The idea is for people to spend more time on their goals, even if it means less time on Apple's goal. On to the second ethical evaluation called utility. During your design process, you can evaluate with this question, am I maximizing well-being for the greatest number of people? The first way to answer this question is by looking to see if the problem is ethical to solve in the first place. We can look at one designer who asked himself this question. From 1909 to 1980, Raymond Lowy was active as an industrial designer. He helped push the streamlined look for trains, cars, and buses. He even designed Air Force One, used by presidents from JFK to Bill Clinton. In a 1979 interview with 60 Minutes, Morley Safer asked Raymond, were there certain things you would not design? Raymond tells a story. The manufacturer said we have a new hand grenade and we would like to increase the fragmentation for more killing or wounded power. Raymond says he was shocked and never touched the project. As designers, we have to ask, is this problem ethical to solve in the first place? I get it, grenades, that's obvious harm. But what about the non-obvious side? How can we maximize the well-being for the greatest number? One way is to search for harm. At MIT Media Lab, research groups spend time developing tech with a mix of science and design. Projects from MIT Media Lab include Guitar Hero, E-Ink, and Lego Mindstorms. The latest project from MIT Media Lab is this thing called Alter Ego by Arniv Kapoor. 
the way alter ego works is your brain's sending an electrical signal to your mouth. This device intercepts it, sends it to a computer. The computer sends information back with some answer. So the reporter asked him, what's the largest city in Bulgaria? He does this. The computer gets the answer. This person, Arnev, says it to the reporter. The reporter's response is, you can be an expert in any subject. You have the entire internet in your head. I'm not sure if you've been on the internet lately. Uh, it's not always reliable. Take, take a look at the medical advice online. Take a look at the news on Facebook. Did any of the designers ask themselves for this specific project, how could this device from MIT Media Lab be used for harm? The director of MIT Media Lab wrote a blog post about uh, a time J.J. Abrams, the famous sci-fi filmmaker, came by the lab. And he asked the, the researchers, do you do anything that involves things like war or surveillance? You know, things that can harm people. And they all said, no, we don't do that. So he reframed the question. Can you imagine an evil villain in any of my shows or movies using anything to do really terrible things? The researchers said, yeah, yeah. One way to search for harm is by forecasting potential ways to reframe the use of your product through primary, secondary, and tertiary experiences. So let's look at Facebook. For Facebook, the primary experience is to create and consume content. The secondary effect is for Facebook to act as a revenue generator through ads. And the tertiary effect is the spread of fake news and clickbait content. The chief operating officer, Shell Sandberg, during the backlash said, we do not think enough about the abuse cases. So how can we? We can map out the extremes for benefits and harms of a feature. Now, take the newsfeed from Facebook. It was designed to show the most useful content in the newsfeed by engagement. However, the most engaged content was actually clickbait headlines They eventually became fake news. Another way to populate this list is to reach out and think about interactions beyond the users that you consider your daily users. Think about groups of people. Think about society. Bring in different people from diverse backgrounds. You can reveal unexpected problems. All right, so get ready for this. Uh, you know, instead of the news feed, it could be artificial intelligence, like computer vision. I was at a museum, and they had a computer vision project. And I put my face in the camera, and the camera's supposed to tell me what it sees. You know, the same technology we're using for self-driving cars. So I let the computer scan my face, and these are the results. That was a Band-Aid. Uh, a neck brace. Nice lolly, a shower cap, and a sunscreen. It's, it's, it's humorous to me. It's funny, uh, but sometimes it's not always funny for folks. Amazon's facial recognition matched 28 members of Congress to criminal mugshots. And law enforcement agencies are using this technology. The harm is that it can cost people's freedom in their lives. And I'm going to put a sub-note here for this audience. Some companies' responses to this, these missteps are, it's the user's fault. They, they didn't set this up correctly. And the response is, well, what are the defaults? Are you just designing for the happy paths? The third test to evaluate your design is to ask, would I sign my name? Virtue's ethics states that people are motivated by moral character. The choices you make represent you and your values. The word design is made up of two words in Latin. The first is de, and the second is signare, which means to mark. There's a saying that you should leave your mark on the world. As designers, our work is the mark. In the 1940s, a designer created the AK-47. He signed his name to it, and this is his mark on the world. Sometimes you don't have to design, I mean, sometimes you, have to, you don't have to sign your name to the work if it's unethical or you don't feel that's a safe choice. In 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger was set to launch. The engineer refused to sign the launch recommendation 
over safety concerns. NASA went ahead, and if you know the story, it ended fatally. Other times you can use your signature to raise an issue. In 2018, when Microsoft sold cloud services to ICE, Microsoft employees use their signature to let their opposition known. And if you don't refuse unethical work, you could go to jail, like the Volkswagen engineer did for creating software to cheat the emissions test. Behavioral scientists have found participants in an experiment would cheat less if they had to sign an oath. You can add an ethical nudge to your work or your team's work by signing a simple statement that your work does no harm to people and society. So here are the three ethics to evaluate your work. And I'll throw in a bonus for you. It's called Veil of Ignorance, which is explained in John Rawls' Theory of Justice book. Another way to think of the Veil of Ignorance is that all positions are fair. We will treat people equal. So if you're designing a system, you're OK to play any role. Because you don't know what role you'll get, you'll try to make each role fair. Let's apply it to Lyft. Lyft has a couple of roles, the passenger, the driver, who is a contractor, and the founders, let's say, the CEOs. I was in a Lyft ride, and this Lyft driver told me, I have to hit so many, so many miles or so many hours driving for Lyft this week. I asked her why. And she said, because if I hit this goal, uh, Lyft rewards me with a coupon. What's the coupon for? Dental care. If the CEOs or founders of Lyft knew that they would be struggling having to work 60 hours a week in a car to just get a coupon for dental care, would they have designed it differently? Another way to look at this is when you hear these phrases during the design process, you can ask yourself, how do you feel if you're in these groups? <laughs> phrases like, it's an edge case. Most of our users, no one will notice. It's only a test. If you take the first one there, it's an edge case. Supposedly, Facebook has 2 billion users. If you take 1% of that for an edge case, that's 2 million people affected. 2 million. Finally, I'll talk very quickly why you should look into this more for yourself and apply ethics to design. On my journey of trying to understand this topic, I've heard different reactions from different people. And there's a list of them. Everyone has a response, which is great. Uh, but to me, it, it kind of sums up to, this is why I'm not going to think about it. This is why I'm not going to include it. This is why it's not my job. And you should find your own motivator. You should find out why you should look into this topic. My, my answer would be for you, for yourself, for your family, for your future, if nothing else, for you. Met Don Norman recently. He's considered one of the founders of user experience. And we talked about this topic for a while. And he said, I believe that designers have an ethical obligation to do better for the world, not to create these things. And it's easy to stand up here and point out missteps of other companies. And I understand we're all in the same boat trying to make good decisions. It reminds me of a quote by Glenn Beck. He said, it's easy to make someone into a monster it's hard to see that you're on that path, too. As designers, we're laying the groundwork for other teams to build a future version of what we're building today. Eventually, this will affect society, and it already has. We need to figure out our ethical framework as designers. Our work is no longer about small, dark patterns, but dark and sometimes harmful experiences for people, which we don't want to become the pattern. You can influence the work that you do to be more well, to focus on the well-being, decrease harm. The ethical responsibility is on you, the designer, because at the end of the day, you have to live with this design as well. So in summary, today we talked about how to create a future for all. We talked about the ethical philosophies here, how to evaluate your work. Finally, I spoke about why you should apply it. Before I go, I want to leave you with one question. What type of mark will you leave on the world? Thank you.